I actually wanted to start with saying that I have a chance to warm you up before the conference, but after the music, I feel that I have to say that I have to cool you down after before the conference. So I'll skip the, the intro uh, and I'll just jump because we don't have enough time. So I'll just jump to what I want to say. I will try to present you uh, the future of software developers, of us software developers, and I will show uh, the clicker. All right. I'll show you four trends which I think are happening right now in the industry for us programmers and they will keep happening in the future. Uh, a few words about myself to make my words more convincing. I'm quite frequent user of GitHub. I have about over a thousand followers there, which is not a huge number, but I'm proud of it. To give you the comparison, uh, Linus Torvalds has got 55,000. So I'm about 50 times smaller than that guy. Uh, I'm an Oracle certified enterprise architect, uh, which means I know something about Java and software architecture. I wrote a few books about object-oriented programming, actually two books. Uh, I have some, follow some followers on Twitter. Again, to give you a comparison, I have about 40, 000, uh, 14,000 and uh, Robert Martin has got 100,000 and Martin Fowler has got 200. So I'm about five times smaller than these guys in this number. Uh, and I have some reputation on Stack Overflow. But the most important thing is that I write code every day. So over the last year, I wrote over 100,000 lines of Java, Ruby, and JavaScript code myself. And I made about, I just calculated, I made about 4,000 commits to all my GitHub repositories. And I'm managing about 100 programmers, well, directly, indirectly, but this is the, the group of people who are more or less under my control. So that's to give you the picture of what's going on. Um, I started to work on international software projects in 2000. And now it's 2017. So looking back 17 years back, I can try to predict the future for another 17 years. That's what I'm going to try to do now, to show you what I think is going to happen in the future, what's happening now, comparing to what was happening 17 years ago. And we can see what will happen in, in 17 years. Uh, 17 years ago, I had 100 developers, quite big office, and it was a traditional outsourcing model. So they were sitting in the office, we were all working on software projects, and uh, pretty traditional service model. Now it's 100 developers, the same amount almost, but we have no office, we work remotely, and we're developing the product. That's the difference. That was the intro. And now I'm getting to the main subject. So the first trend, which I think is happening now and will continue to happen, is that the balance between the price of hardware and the price of us programmers is different. The balance is different. If you look at this graph, it's not exact numbers, but you will get the idea by looking at the graph. Here's the first line, which shows what happened to the price of hardware over the last 17 years. So seven, in 2000, to get one gigabyte of RAM, for the server, and we were working with web servers that time, and now we're doing the same, we were paying $1,000 for one gigabyte. Now we're paying $5, which means that about 20 times our hardware now is cheaper. And it's not only about memory, it's also about hard drive, the speed of CPU, the speed of uh, internet lines, everything. So everything now is 20 times cheaper and means 20 times faster and better for us programmers. So the hardware environment is more easy to work with. And this is the, the graph which shows the, the dynamic of our salaries. So if in California, a good programmer was getting about $80,000 a year 17 years ago, now the same programmer is getting $250,000 a year. So it's the same programmer, the same set of technologies, more or less. It's still Java. It was 17 years ago. It was Java 1.2. Now it's Java what, 7, Java 8. It's the same PHP. It was PHP 3, now it's PHP 5 or 6 or 7. But it's still the same more or less set of technologies. But for some reason, the environment is 20 times easier to work in, but we're charging three times more for doing the same job. So that means, well, first of all, it means we're getting three times more lazy, or actually 60 times more lazy than, than we were before. But on a more serious note, I think the situation changed in a way who is our client? Who is our main problem in our job? For Not me, for us developers, but for people who are actually paying for projects. So in 2000, it was computers. 
So we were developing software for computers. They were the most money-consuming and uh, effort-consuming targets. It was necessary to create software which was fast, which was small, which was able to fit into a small computer, which was very expensive. That was the main goal, to develop for computers. Now the goal is different. We have to develop for people because people are more expensive than computers. Now our software, our code, has to be understood by people, not by computers. It's less important right now whether the software is fast. It's way more important whether the software is understood by those expensive programmers who will charge that big amount of money to refactor it, to do something with it. So the main goal is changed. Now we have to write for people, but we had in the, in the, in the past, we were writing for computers. And that, I think, is a big change in mentality. We had hackers 20 years ago, 17 years ago. We, were, we had people who were working, uh, who were able to develop small software, very fast, very um, compact. And now we have the, the time of designers. This is the main trend. So hackers are in the past, designers are in the future. And this is actually, I can put the VS between these two names, two, 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 two titles, because it's really different mentalities, I believe. So let me show you what I think hackers are thinking about. So hackers are people who are, first of all, they code for, for other hackers. They like to write code which is difficult to understand. They enjoy the code being difficult, being really using all the possible features of the language, being encrypted, obscure, and they enjoy, they enjoy seeing stuff which is difficult to read. So they write for other hackers. They, want to, they, they feel respect when the, when the newbies and new programmers, juniors, don't understand their code. They find standards and rules boring, so they don't like any standards to put on them. They like to feel the freedom. They, they enjoy being free in all the things they develop. They don't like unit testing, so they feel like, I code, you unit test. So I put this stuff into production, and then the junior developers show up, and then later this will be covered by the unit test. So that's like for juniors. My job is I'm a hacker, I'm a professional developer, I know how to fix stuff. You do the unit testing. Firefighting is fun, so they like to wake up in the middle of the night and fix stuff in production directly. They just go on the console, they fix stuff there right in the production environment. They feel, I can only do this because I'm so professional. Nobody can. I know how to do stuff. They enjoy it. They think that firefighting or you know, overtime work is actually where their professionalism is celebrated. They don't like to document stuff. They like to talk. You have a question, come talk to me. You don't understand how my code works? Come talk to me, I'll explain to you. I don't like to, to write documentation, I find it boring. And of course, they don't like you to touch my code. So I'm a professional, this is my code, I wrote it, I will fix it. If you don't like it, tell me, I'll fix it. I don't like anybody to touch my code. This is the mentality of hackers, and I believe it was 17 years ago. Now time has changed, and we have the mentality of designers, which is a completely different group of people, with a completely different mindset. First of all, they like to code for newbies, for people who don't, are not really professionals. They, they enjoy creating code which is easy to understand by people who are not really professional, who, are not really like, who not, don't really know everything about the product. They find it really uh, intelligent to write something which is easy to read. Second, they find that standards and rules are actually fun to have. So they like static analysis. Uh, they like some extra control tools to put on top of their code. They like to be controlled by the rules and standards they set. Of course, they find unit testing is for professionals. So writing code is like 30% of the job, and then 70% is writing the unit test. And they find it more even interesting. So coding is kind of for juniors, but unit testing is for professionals. That's what designers feel. Firefighting, of course, is annoying. So waking up in the middle of the night, fixing something on production through console, this is, the, this is an embarrassment for them. They feel like if that happens, it means they're not professional. If somebody, if, the, if I have to go to console in the middle of the night and on Sunday, it means I'm doing, I'm doing a low, lousy job. So that's my fault, if I'm a designer. Of course, they like to document things and not talk. So if there is the question arrive and something is not clear, then, some, then th this unclear question has to be documented. So they don't like to explain it every time to new programmers, they explain again and again. They don't, like to, they don't, they don't feel this is a professional way to uh, share knowledge. They like to document stuff, to maybe in documentation, maybe it's wiki pages, but somehow. And of course, they enjoy when their code is being refactored. So they want to see that their code is shared in the team and everybody can touch the code. They feel that the more contributors one file has, the higher is the professional level of the entire project. 
So that's two different mentalities, that, as you can see. And this one was in 2000. It was we were working, uh, we were trying to make the code execute perfectly. We wanted our code to run fast. We wanted our code to, uh, to perform better than it was performing before. Now, it's the question of how maintainable is the code, how easy it is to read, how easy we can transfer that piece of code from one team to another, and then that another team will understand it e like easier, as well as, as well as we can do. That's the trend, and I think it will continue because the hardware will go down in prices. Computers will become cheap and really inexpensive. Even, even smartphones will become super fast like we have servers now. So the time of designers is coming. So what's my plan? According to this trend, of course, I want to be a designer. I was a hacker 20 years ago. Now I want to be a designer. And I'm telling you, probably, this is what you should also do. So think about your elegancy of your code, the beautiness of your code, instead of the, the speed and, and hacks you can put in there. That's the first trend. The second trend is that we have outsourcing now. So 20 years ago, we were developing, developing, developer. Now we are taking parts from open source community, taking components and putting them together. So now mostly the job of a programmer is like 80% of time we're finding the components we need to combine together, we're learning, we're reading about how to use them, and then we put some, some, some code on top of that. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. Why? because we didn't have that many open source code in open source. This is the graph I found in one article which was published 10 years ago. Uh, and the analysis shows the graph which kind of demonstrates that uh, open source community grows fast and this is the amount of lines of code we have in open source. But that was 10 years ago. It was already really fast growing market. It was before the time of GitHub. The GitHub showed up on the market about seven years ago, and now it's a massive platform where everybody are, and almost all the code, all open source code are, is there. Some of the some of the repositories, like take Docker for example, it's one of the biggest one in the amount of contributors. It has 8,000 people who actually submitted some code changes there. 8,000 people for one really small repository. It's not a huge one. So so many people contribute to one piece of code. If you're not there, you have to be there. Think about it. There are 20 million active repositories. It's probably the biggest number you can ever imagine in any other platforms. 11 million users. Some studies say that this is the total amount of programmers in the world. So it's approximately 10, 10 million programmers we have right now in the world. And looks like all of them are on GitHub. Well, maybe some accounts are not active, but still. They, they claim, GitHub says, that they... Uh, they got 80 million pull requests since 2010. I'm giving you all these numbers to show that this piece of code they have is way bigger than any piece of code you can create yourself, on any company you can create yourself, be it Microsoft, Oracle, Facebook, whatever. It's a huge territory of code which is way bigger than anything we can create in the private repositories, in private space. This means, what does it mean for us? This article, it's quite fresh, says that uh, companies are moving their open their code, which was private before, they're moving that code to open source territory. So more and more companies are making their code open for developers. And they're doing it, we're talking about companies who are making money. We can start from companies like Red Hat and Cloudera, which are completely entirely based on open source uh, code. And then to Google, Facebook, Twitter, which are moving some pieces of code to open source. They're not really relying on open source, but they're just opening the code. And we can see, I, I saw articles saying, explaining that Wells Fargo, it's a bank, also opened something and made some open source contribution. So starting from Red Hat down to Wells Fargo, all companies are interested to move their code to open source. What does it mean for us, for developers? It means that we are becoming open source contributors. Either you like it or not, either you understand it or not, but we, all of you, you, us, everybody, we are open source contributors. Some of you more, some of you less. But even if you use the stuff which is open source, you're already contributing. You're using Linux system, you're using Android, you're using uh, some Java tools and utilities, you are, an open, so you are an open source contributor. But you can be an active one or you can be a passive one. You can give them something back or you can just use them. I think it's the question of how, how uh, professional you want to be, how bright you're going to be your future. So if you want to be in this trend, then I think you have to be more in open source. You have to give them something back. I'll give you some graph which 
which demonstrates what I'm trying to say, but graphically. So this is your code. This is the code you create, a private code. You write this code to make money. This is the company around the code. So you create some product, and then you put the service on top of that, and you sell it to the market. Customers pay you, you get the salary. It works perfectly, but this is our code. So look at how small you are and how big we are. I mean, we means open source people. So our code is way bigger than anything you can create. And because of that, you have to be with us in order to be, uh, in order to be successful as a developer and as a business. There's one company which actually is making money right now out of this completely. So Red Hat is the champion company in this area and they are probably the best and the single one which is able to make money just on open source software. So they have the open source product which they're taking from the market and then they put the service on top of that and they make money. So they're in, actually in their case, the graph looks like this. This is how it should be. So your code has to be really small and then you put the service and then you take the our code and that becomes the business. So that's gonna be the future. The Red Hat map model, I believe, will become the model for many, many more companies than, than we have right now. So more companies will move their stuff, move their code to open source, to open source territory. Let people modify it, let people contribute to it. And then companies will add service on top of that and maybe some small amount of their private code. So that's how the picture will look in the future. If you want to be with the future, if you want to be the programmer of the future, you have to be in the, in, the, in the blue circle. You have to be where the open source is. Because if you stay in the green circle, it will become smaller, smaller, and smaller. And it will be less and less territory for you to, to make money and to be a professional developer. That's my point. So we have to move to open source. We have to contribute. So here's my plan. What I'm going to do with this trend. First of all, I'm planning to create my own projects. So I want to be in open source, and I do that already, and I, I'll continue to do that. I'll create small projects in open source and give it to people because I want to be in the blue circle. Second, I want to grow the amount of followers. I mentioned that in the beginning that I have a thousand, about 1,200 followers right now on GitHub. It's still a small number, I want more. I don't want more because I just like the number, but I want more people to use my stuff. I want, I want to be more connected to open source territory because I understand that this is the future. So I'm working for, this, for these guys. I'm working for these followers. I'm giving them something and I'm looking at who is following me. Who are my users? Who is using my stuff? I'm checking statistics. I'm looking at who is downloading my projects. I'm checking who is putting stars on my projects on GitHub. So I'm paying attention to this. It's not because I feel proud of that. It's not my ego. It's like really professional, materialistic interest. I want to know how am I connected to the open source community. And I want to be as much connected as possible. Second, uh, the third one, I want to watch them. I want to watch what's happening with GitHub, with, uh, GitHub and open source stuff. I watch other projects. I'm subscribed to GitHub uh, uh, every week, updates about the trending projects on GitHub. I'm looking at what people are doing. I'm trying to understand where they are moving. I'm checking their stuff sometimes, even when I don't contribute. I'm still watching the community. I need to, to know where it's heading. I'm telling you that probably you should do the same. And of course, I, I'm, I, I'm planning to open my code more and more. So I'm working on a project from a private project right now, and we have private code as well. But we are always trying to make that private code as small as possible. So every time I'm looking at my code, I'm thinking, can I make that particular mi microservice open? And if I can, if I feel that I'm not going to lose a lot of intellectual property, if nobody's going to actually steal that from me, then I make it open source. Even web services, even web systems, even utility, command line tools, libraries, everything. Every time I start developing something, I'm always asking myself, can I make it open source? And if I can, I make it open source. So don't keep repositories private unless you really need to do that. And this is like really privacy concerns about that. In most cases, make it open. You will only benefit from that. That was the second trend. Now number three, we have four in total. The situation is really changed in a way, in other words, we are global now and we were local 20 years ago, thanks to the internet. So we have so fast internet right now, we have video conference tools, we have all the technical instruments to become global. So we work remotely, we stay remotely, and even though many companies are still working in cubicles, even though many companies are still have offices and they want programmers to sit together, the trend is that it's not going to happen in the future. In the future, the future will look completely different according to my expectations. 
we don't hire any more programmers in Riga or in Moscow or in, uh, or in Kiev. We hire just a programmer. We were programmers, we were Russian programmers before, and American programmers before, and Indian programmers before. Now we are just programmers. Because the market is global. So if you think of yourself that you are a programmer from Riga, then in 10 years, that will completely disappear. You will be just a programmer on a global market. Well, I already feel like that, but you will definitely, all of you will definitely feel that in 10 years. And because of that, because companies are now looking at global markets when they're trying to find people, then people should also change the way they present themselves to companies. And the rules of the market are changing. Because it was a small market before, it was a local market in just one town, Riga, or maybe one small country like Latvia. But now the rules are completely different. The company is here in Riga, but the company is hiring from the global market. Because of that, there are many changes. First of all, references. Now it's difficult to know how do we know that programmer is good. If the programmer is from Bali or from Moscow and you're sitting here, so how do you actually know where to ask for references? It's difficult. And now the programmers need to find ways how to prove that they can be trustable. There are some systems for that, there are some instruments, they're not really complete, but in the future there will be a big question. How can we trust people from different pieces, of, from different parts of the world? Second, skills. If yesterday we were looking for a Java developer and then we have a project with Hadoop and this Java developer doesn't know Hadoop, okay, we're gonna train that programmer because what else? We, have, we, don't, have a cha we don't have a choice. We have just five people in Riga, you know, suitable for us and open on the market. Now we have a market of, of 50,000 people in Java. So we select people with Java 8 and Hadoop experience. So now skills mean completely different things. If before it was more important just to have a programmer, now people, now companies are e really able to find specific skills they're looking for. Not just people and then we train them, but they can find people who have specific skills. So we as programmers need to think more about being just programmers, but more about programmers with specific set of skills. Because that's what's gonna happen in the future. Companies will find us by skills, not by just being us, you know, programmers in general. Personality, doesn't matter that much at all, because now we're remote, so that people don't pay attention to uh, how good you are, how, I mean, what's your, what's your age, what's your race, what's everything. It, it doesn't really matter, because they work remotely, and sometimes they don't even talk to you like every day. They just send you tasks, and they just send you specifications, and then you send them back from Bali, your results, and they transfer money over PayPal, and that's it. So they don't pay attention to personalities. So 20 years ago, if the team was like of, of people, which are of guys which are 50 years old, and then somebody who is 20 comes in, then most probably they're not going to hire that person because, you know, it's not a good fit by the age or whatever. Now it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a fit as long as you have proper skills, as long as you have proper references or whatever. So that's, that's changing. So personality matters less and less. The rate. The rate is also really different now. If yesterday it was the New York rate and, and, and Riga rate, and there were completely different rates, so if you were in New York, you were charging $100 an hour, and in Riga you were charging 20 euros an hour, an hour, then now it's not happening anymore because now it's just a programmer and your price is just 20 euros or it's just $100. So the employer will just compare these two numbers and say, why do I have to hire somebody from New York or whatever for 100 if it's exactly the same programmer in Riga or whatever, I don't care where the person is. So now to charge $100 an hour, you need to be a better programmer. It's not enough anymore to just move to New York and say, hey, now I'm $100. I lived in Riga and now I moved, I bought the tickets, I got the visa, now it's 100. Maybe now you can do that, but in 10 years, in 20 years, it definitely will not be possible. If you decide to move to California, you have to be five times better than you were before sitting in Moscow. So, which means, I think, that people will move to California less and less often. It will be easier for us to move to Bali and charge the, pr the price which is, which is comparable to, the, to, to our skills and knowledge. Legal status, it doesn't matter anymore as well. If it was important to have a work permission to work, for example, in Riga, like for me, I need, being from Ukraine, I need a work permission to work in Riga. Now I can work remotely and this legal status doesn't matter anymore. And that will be the future as well. So we will not apply for visas, we will just work remotely, travel sometimes for meetings and conferences, and that will be it. So again, having the visa will not be an advantage for a programmer. It will all be about skills and qualification. And education, education doesn't, doesn't really will doesn't it's not going to matter at, at all well not at all but it's not going to matter with the remote and global market because the employer will not know what this 
San Paolo Technical University means actually. Because who knows how big is that university and who knows actually is it a university or just two people signing diplomas. Or maybe it's a huge university with a hundred year history. So the employer being in Riga will not pay as much attention to education status as much as the employer will pay attention to your certification given by Oracle for example or your uh, status on Stack Overflow given by the community. So employers will pay attention less to education, to formal diplomas, and pay more attention to how much the market actually judged you, how much you, gave, you got from the market, and really global authorization uh, companies like, like Oracle, uh, Microsoft, and whatever, companies they, which give certifications. And the last one is the language. So the English is becoming the language number one. We can see it now if you look at the countries like, I know my country like Ukraine or, or Russia, if you look there and if you, if you talk to a programmer who doesn't speak English and the programmer who does speak English and they, they're exactly the same programmers with the same level of Java, they, they, they're getting like three or sometimes two or sometimes three times less salary if there is no English on the profile. So now, if you don't speak English, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough English on your uh, English abilities in your in your profile, you're going to get just less money because more and more projects are becoming international because of the global market. I think that in 10 years, maybe my English will not be enough to make money as I'm making them now. So I will. I'm also trying to you know to improve it every day because I understand that English is becoming the main language. So that's that's what's happening with the market and. Uh, there are a few platforms which are helping us to, uh, to be remote, to be global, to develop. But I don't think, you probably know some of them, uh, but I don't think they're perfect. I think they will be changing and changing dramatically and they will probably, some of them will just disappear from the market. Some of them will pr offer some new services. And that is the great, I think, great market, great opportunity for developers to introduce something there. Because we're moving global really fast and the companies and startups and services are not really catching up that fast. So we need some instruments for better managing remote people remotely, to better transferring payments, to charge less. Because now this PayPal and Upwork, they charge like sometimes 20, up to 20% for the money people transfer from one programmer to another, which is ridiculous. It's too, too high for, uh, for the software market. We're not you know, selling drugs, we're just using the normal service. So we, they're supposed to charge like 1%, 2%. But now it's, the market is really not really uh, mature. And my point is that that's a huge opportunity for us to, to develop something there. So the future will look, there are four claims I'll make about the future in this, in this, in this um, domain. First of all, I believe there will be no offices in 20 years. We will just work remotely and globally. Maybe they will have some, you know, some hotel rooms, some conferences to get together for a few days, but there will be definitely no offices where you have to get at 9 a.m. and then go back home at 5 p.m. That, I think, traditional model will just disappear for us software developers. There will be no salaries, I think. We will be sitting, I mean, not no money, but no salaries. We'll be sitting remote and we'll be charging for results, not for the time we spend in the office. Because now, mostly, they pay us for being in the office, not for delivering results, but for being there. And then if we deliver, it's good. If we don't deliver, then okay, then maybe it's not so good. But in the future, it will be you get the result, we get the money. That's, I think, will happen remotely because it will be difficult to control and nobody will be interested to control what's happening with this guy in Bali. Either he or she is programming or not. We just want the results. So it's really difficult to control and see what these eight hours of work is spent for on Facebook or Java programming. So there will be no salaries. There will be no meetings, I think. Again, it will be a big waste of time because people will be all remote, different time zones, and putting them all together to discuss stuff will be less and less uh, effective, less and less uh, needed, and we will use some tools and instruments to share information, which we, we're not still have, we don't still have that tools, but they will show up in the future. And I think there will be no managers, so people will be self-managed, so programmers will know how to manage themselves, the instruments will be, instruments will be quite powerful, and we'll be able to work in projects without somebody sitting on top of us and controlling our day-to-day -day work. So there will be proper instruments for doing that. So we are becoming freelancers, actually. So we will not have managers, we will, all of us will become freelancers. Now maybe this word sounds for you like some cheap dude sitting in Bali with, you know, with little shorts and, 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 and just typing something, getting no money. But in the future, every single, every professional programmer will be a freelancer, meaning that they are, they are, they, we, will, we, will be, we will be really free in the market. We will, be con we will be contributing to projects instead of just sitting in the offices. 
And maybe that's my prediction. Maybe there will be no, you know, companies, just projects. So there is a project. We need to develop something. We join together. We give our knowledge. We contribute like in open source. We, we put something in there. The project becomes successful, and then we just go back home. And then another project, and another project. So the idea of having a company where people are just sitting there for a lifetime, I think it will, be, it will disappear. Well, I hope. So my plan, taking into account this trend. Um, first of all, I'm going to invest into my resume. So I understand that being a freelancer, meaning that I will always have to demonstrate who I am. If now we're in the same city, if, the, for example, I'm in Riga, then people kind of know me, and it's, for me, it's, it's easier to find a job because people know me, they're friends and connections and everything. In the future, if the market is global, it's always going to be the question of who are you? We don't know you. Show us who you are. Show us the resume. And the resume has to be bright. It has to contain all the right credentials, which will guarantee me that I will get the position in that project. So I need to invest into that. I need to, to gain some certifications, some reputations, some GitHub points, some Stack Overflow reputation, uh, all of that. Second, I want to study management. So we, I realized that freelancers are people who know not just how to write Java code, but also how to manage projects. Not they not, it's not doesn't mean they will have to manage, but they understand how the project is being managed. So being a good programmer now means that we have to understand Agile, you have to understand Scrum, you have to understand all the management principles which will be applied to you when you are in the project. So I'm going to continue to study that. Uh, and I will try to be independent. So I understand that a freelancer is somebody who is not a person with a guaranteed salary. So which means that I need to think about how to be financially independent, more or less. So I'm trying to create sometimes some small projects which may generate some revenue. I'm publishing books, for example. I'm writing a blog which will potentially, may potentially give me some money. So I'm saying that probably all of you also should think the same direction. So think about how you will be financially independent when the era of freelancers will come. That's the trend. And now the last one, the last trend in the industry. Uh, years ago, 20 years, 10 years ago, companies were investing into marketing and promotion in order to sell something. They were paying for that. Now it's a time of evangel evangelists. So now companies, in order to put the product on the market, they understand that it's way better to hire an evangelist or an advocate, so-called, instead of just paying money for promotion. So you know who the, the evangelist is, right? It's a person who is talking, it's like, <laughs> well, I'm not an evangelist, but you will meet many evangelists in this conference. They will be talking about something, but they will mention some products as well. So they will come from some companies, and they will give you the presentation about something which is not directly connected to the product, but in that area. So they will create communities about, around them. Now I'll explain what I mean. So this is the traditional uh, hierarchy of, um, of titles for a technical person. So you start as a tester, well, not necessarily, but it goes like that. And then you become a junior developer, then you're just a developer, then you're a senior, and then you're the software architect. Now, there's one more position on top of that, which is called technology evangelist or technology advocate. It's like a technology, it's like a software architect, but that's a person with the community around. So it's not just a person who knows how to develop something and how to create the architecture and how to put this UML diagrams on the board and how to connect Java, Java modules. But that's a person who is known in some community. So there are some people behind that, that the, him or her. And the community which you can bring to the team is way more valuable, not way more, but it's, it's now it is valuable, but in the future it will be way more valuable than anything else. So when the company will hire you or the, product will, well, the project will invite you, if you are positioning yourself as a level of a software architect, they will pay more, more and more attention of how big is your community. So what you're going to give us in, besides your ability to create that small product, but how big is your open source fellowship? How many people know you on GitHub? How many people follow you on Twitter? Because you, we join, you join our team, we develop the product, and remember, we are just that small and the open source is that big. So the question is going to be how much of that big territory you can bring to us and convince them that this product means something. So you have to have it, you have to have it with you. If you don't have it, you're just, a small, you're just a software architect, which will be definitely paid less than the person with the community. 
So having that in mind, you have to build the community. That's my point. You have to build it somehow. I'll show you a few instruments which I'm using to build my community. I don't have a huge one, but there's some community. I have some community. And you can do it as well. To build the community, you have to give them something, I believe. So you have to start giving the people something for free, and they will start, start following you and listening to you and watching your presentations and reading your blog. So first of all, of course, it's a blog. So if you have a blog with some technical knowledge and you share your stuff, you post some you know, code examples there or some ideas, then you will get some, some followers definitely, obviously. They will come and read you because, because it's free. And, it's, and it will make sense, of course. You can make webinars. You can organize webinars and teach them something. Tell them about the technologies you're working on. Tell them about the products. Tell them, tell them something. Teach them something. Even though, even though you're not really maybe on the highest level, not at the software architect right now, if you're just a developer, you still have something to talk. You still have something to show the people. And they will, they will follow you. Pull requests. You can submit stuff to open source repositories. And people who work with that repositories, their maintainers, administrators, their founders, they will definitely look at your profile. They will be interested to know who is contributing, who is this person who is actually giving us something for free. And they will also become, maybe some of them will become your followers on GitHub. You can teach somewhere, in a local university, local school, you can organize a few lessons and teach like kids or junior developers about something. They will grow up in a few years, they will become developers and they will still gonna be, they will still can, can, uh, remain your Twitter followers. They will still gonna hear what you're saying. And then when the company hires you in five years, like Oracle gets you or some big startup gets you, and then you will bring these guys together with you. Not together, but you will say something on Twitter and these people will listen. And the company will really appreciate that because this is how the marketing will happen. They will not pay anything. They will just hire you and the entire community will come with you. You can make workshops like at conferences like this one. You can make it for money, you can make money or you can make it free. You can submit to some conferences and say, hey, I'm going to organize a workshop. Maybe I'm not that professional yet, but I'll do it for free or pay me something. So some training, some workshops for four, eight hours, something like that. Again, people who will be, who will be at that workshop, they will become your community, some of them. Like, look at this. Look at my left top corner. This is my Twitter handler. I'm telling you, after this presentation, I'll get like at least 10 followers on Twitter. So some people will hear that and they will follow me on Twitter and they will become my community. So even though I'm doing it for free, nobody's paying me for this presentation, but I'm, 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 I'm spending my time, I prepared that presentation, and I get some followers. And then these followers, in two years, when I have some new product, I'll say it on Twitter, hey, this product is a great one, and some of them will become clients. You see how it works? Of course, the product. You can make a product, you can develop it, like I said, open source product, or you're working right now on the product, so give it to somebody. I mean, some product you can give for free. Again, that will generate some followership. And of course, Stack Overflow. You know this platform, it's a huge one. You can generate really a big amount of followers and a really big community there. Uh, I have like 50,000 reputation points, but you know probably the guy John Skid, he's got um, over a million uh, reputation points, there's a number one, and I believe the whole world knows him just because of that, because he's so active on Stack Overflow, so he's contributing there enormously. So for example, I'll give you the number, I answered total in Stack Overflow, I answered about 500 questions there, and he answered 30, 33,000 questions. So he's answering and answering and answering. He's spending like probably half of his day or maybe even less, maybe, maybe less, maybe more, but he's spending that time for, for the last seven or six years just to help people on Stack Overflow. He's not getting any money out of it. Nobody is paying him for that. Like nobody paid me for asking that questions and answering questions on Stack Overflow. But that is the community. So I know him. If I'm following him on Twitter, and I started to follow John Skid on Twitter just because I found him on Stack Overflow. If he says something on Twitter, I definitely pay attention. So I easily can become a client of the company he may work for the future in. <coughs> and of course, books. If you write books, definitely you will have a big community because books people buy, people read. I mean, they will appreciate, they will, they will respect you for that. So my point is that the market is the judge now and becoming more and more, not the employer. If it was the employer before, if 20 years ago you were coming to find a job somewhere and uh, you, were, you had to convince the employer that you're good, now you have to convince the market that you're good. You have to build the community of people who will say, yes, that person is good. And that will be enough to convince the employer. 
So work on the market, contribute to the market which is open, to contribute to open source, to people who you don't know, give them something, and then the employer will give you something back, I mean money. So that's how it's going to work, and it works already. So my plan, I'm finishing. So my plan is, I want to build communities. I'll keep doing it in any possible way. I'll keep speaking at conferences. I'm telling probably you should do the same. You can find different conferences. There are many of them about software development, and and and, and keep keep speaking there. Um, so maybe the main point is that you have to give away more than you take back. So that will take time. You will, you will do that for years. You will do that for two, three, four years, and then you will see how it will start paying you back. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But when it starts paying you back in five years, in 10 years, you'll be on top of others. That's for sure. So that's the summary. I finished. First of all, to summarize the four points I made. The point number one, be a designer, don't be a hacker. The time of hackers is gone. It doesn't matter how fast is your code. What matters is how, is how maintainable it is, how readable it is, how elegant it is. Second, contribute to open source. That's the main thing now is happening. So be there, be inside of that community. Number three, invest into your resume. This is the main asset you're going to have in 10 years, your resume, your profile, your, your face. This is your face. This is what's going to turn, this is what's going to be convertible to money. Just your resume. Not just, but your resume, of course. And, of course, grow your community. That's the last point I wanted to make. Grow it, invest into it, spend something there, give them something for free. They will grow and you will become better. This is your value, this is your asset, your community, your resume and your community. I wrote an article about that. This is my last slide. I wrote an article about that. This is the link to the blog. So you can follow me, you can check my blog. The article was like two years old and there are many discussions about that. We don't have time for discussions, but you can find me after. And I have another talk about object-oriented programming before lunch today. So also, I would love to see you there. Thank you very much.